All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk, and uh, featuring a great band today that I have not had on yet, which is very rare. Uh, welcome to the show, Robert John and the Wreckers, which obviously it's just Robert John here. How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Where are you? I'm in Savannah, Georgia, currently. Are you on tour? We're, uh, we're, uh, we're recording some new music out here. Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're in Savannah, Georgia. It's weird. <laughs> it's beautiful out there, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I'm looking out over the river and the, the dock, and man, you can't beat it. What's the name of the studio? I honestly don't know. Uh, we're recording out here with Dave Cobb um, and making some new music. Oh, you tell that fucking Dave Cobb <laughs> that I've been trying to get him on this goddamn show for seven years. And, you know, Jay Buchanan is one of my yeah. best friends. And also I've had the Warren Treaty on. I've had on pretty much, uh, you know, uh, uh, everybody that he's been producing over <laughs> the years. And uh, I've been fucking shouting him out and tooting his horn calling him the uh the new rick rubin i can't get yeah. this fucker on and you know he had a podcast for a minute remember yeah 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 well i mean i can do my best i'll relay the message thank you so much man <laughs> i'm a big fan of his and and uh i love what he does and he's got a great great fucking track record yeah. and um wow savannah now his studio's in nashville though right yeah um yeah it's switching things up a little bit oh you look all mysterious <laughs> there like yeah you know I, I don't know i don't know what i can say i don't know what i can't say you know he's, yeah, uh, yeah. he's a mysterious guy so um but yeah we're here in savannah georgia and we're making some new music so we're, it's great now that's interesting because you're here to promote your new record you know it's yeah. just about to come out red moon rising <laughs> And you're already yeah. recording some new stuff. How does this happen? Uh, how does Cobb find you and all of that? Oh, man, if, if if I knew all the answers, I would let you know. But, you know, I mean, we recorded Red Moon Rising last year. Um, and it's, you know, it's finally coming out in, the, in June of this year. So it just seemed about, you know, the right time to, to get back in the studio and, and start working on the next one. Um, and then that way this one can come out next year too. So we're always working. We're always touring and, and writing and playing music. So part of the progression. And does, does Cobb find you or words? I mean, obviously if you're in a band right now, you really want to work with Dave Cobb in my eyes and ears yeah. um, because he, um, he knows what the hell he's doing. And, you know, uh, I believe he did the uh, Stapleton records and yep. those things are goddamn masterpieces and the stuff he's done with rival sons is just unreal. How do you seek him out or does he find you? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think we've known his name since rival sons had been working with him for so long. And um, so the name was always there. And then throughout the progression of time, you know, it's just, you know, Jason Isbell and, and, and Chris Stapleton and, you know, everybody, um, we had a, we had an opportunity. Um, we got connected through some some various channels uh, to do like two tracks with him. Uh, last man, I think it was a little over a year ago now. Um, so we we got to do two tracks and and it just it worked out so well. We wanted to do a record, and so it, it just took us this long to uh, finally figure out the scheduling and figure out how it works. And, and now we're here, and um, yeah, hoping to make the best record we can. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, your band. I had kind of, uh, I was kind of hip to you guys on that Do You Remember song in 2020. And of course, I'm a, a huge Almond Brothers and Roots Rock, Americana Rock fan. I played that type of music for, you know, a many, many, many years, but it didn't really stick to me. I think at the time, there was just so sure. much out. I heard the song, I go, oh yeah, yeah, sounds good. And didn't really, um, you know, dig in. But it's wild to think that you guys are an Orange County band. I don't know where you live now, but a Los Angeles, Orange County area band. Um, yeah, and I, still there. I, yeah, I'd never seen you. 
And what an interesting place to start the style of music that you're playing. And so what is the ground floor of that? Were you were you playing the Roxy and the whiskey and all that shit back in the day, 2011? I mean, we, we played them. Um, but we, we, we took like a hold to Europe um, early on. And uh, we kind of put all those eggs in that basket because we were seeing growth and, and, and it was working for us. We were touring in the States and then playing in LA before that and just couldn't figure it out, you know, like we can only go to Nebraska so many times and, and, uh, you know, uh, playing LA was always just a, a crap shoot sometimes. So we, we tried something new out and we started going to Europe in 2015, I believe. And, uh, we just kept going out there and kept building a fan base out there. And now we're going out there, you know, two to three times a year for different stuff and, you know, taking a roadmap from, from other bands that we were looking up to like the Suns and everything and seeing, you know, success that they had over over the seas and everything and um yeah kind of I, we still don't play los angeles very often if very much at all you know we, we come home and we'll do like a a big orange county home show um and then we just hit the road again so we're doing a lot of uh, touring in the states uh, this past year and this year too which has been a lot more than usual well it it is an interesting route i would say all the way back to you know the strokes and kings of leon and that that was the formula because over in europe they have uh i would say better music taste but not only that they don't look for the flavor of the week they grab a band that they love and they support them from the bottom all the way until the end and yeah. that is an amazing thing when you look at like Kings of Leon, man. They were fucking huge over there. And Rival Sons right now selling out big, big venues over there. Yeah. And um and that's that's a, a wild format, right? Because here you are in the States and you're trying to, you know, you're playing clubs, you're in a van, but then you go over yeah. there and you play to like three thousand people. Yeah, I mean, we're still working on that number, but uh, I mean, some festivals and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, it's just a, it's a, and and the people that are coming, um, you know, you could you go play a club anywhere in the states, right? And uh, there could be, I don't know, two hundred people there, but sometimes a hundred of those people came to see, and a hundred of those people came because it's a, it's a bar, and they just want to see their friends, you know. But out in Europe, you can you can sit in a club with eight hundred people, and they all came to to listen to music. You know, they, they, that's why they're there. That's the only reason they came. Um, so it just, it's a different kind of aspect, you know, especially, especially at a band at our level, you know, uh, in the States, just comparing that to Europe is just wild. Yeah, it really is. How do you start a band like this in Orange County and find players in Orange County? Were you in multiple bands years back? Like, were you playing different styles of music? Like, were you in like a, uh, you know, Orange County is known for that offspring sound of just kind of, uh, you know, that type of punk rock, or if you got no doubt in that whole scene years ago, how do you start, uh, with this style out there? Because it is straight up Southern roots type rock. Yeah. I mean, everyone in the band was playing in whatever bands throughout high school and everything. And, and, uh, a lot of punk rock and, you hard rock and um i was a drummer in like a garage rock band for years um we were all playing music everywhere that we could you know and um but when we kind of started robert john the wreck we were we were just writing songs that we enjoyed and then playing them how we like to play them uh we didn't sit down and say hey we're gonna do this southern rock thing because no one else is doing it around us um whether or not subconsciously that's what was going on or not but we just started playing how we love playing and uh you know started playing with the slide guitar which i wouldn't say a lot of people were doing in orange county and that kind of it, people hear that slide guitar and they hear like a a soulful rock song and they don't know where to put it they put it into southern rock and then uh, which is fine you know i think it helps i think it helps people listen to music when they know where to classify it oh yeah in a sense um, so we're, we were always fine with it, you know? Um, and then people started hearing our music who 
didn't come to our show in Costa Mesa, you know, or Long Beach. And they're like, oh, well, this, these these guys have to be from Atlanta or, or Georgia or, you know, something like that. And then they find out that we're not, and it kind of throws them for a spin. They, they have to figure out why we're playing this music. And uh, honestly, we're just doing what we love to do and playing the music we love to play. It's as simple yeah. as that for the most part. I mean, you could be doing the hardest thing um, that a band could possibly do, play your style of music and be uh, living in Orange County, you know, Southern California, and not moving to like Nashville or Memphis or, you know, something like that. It, I mean, that's just the fucking hardest. You know, you're like, <laughs> hey, uh, this is what we play. And they're like, what? You know, I mean, yeah. Black Crows are playing here. Uh, next month, and that's the only room we have for this type of music. <laughs> yeah, know? right. Yeah, it's it's wild, and we we do a lot of touring in the south, and uh, you know, Orange County is probably the farthest away you can get to Savannah, Georgia. You know what I mean? Like, it's uh, so we we've, we've kind of figured out a process of of kind of where places to leave the van, so we're not driving cross country for we're not just driving through Texas every every month, and um, yeah, you know, it's it's. We, we have our, our strong footing in Orange County, you know, kind of where we grew up and the people we know out there. And we always come back and play there. And, you know, we're, we're playing everywhere as much as we can. But it, we definitely have a stronger pool as far as stateside goes, uh, you know, in the, in the southern states, which is well, well, great also for us. We love it down the, there. You're picking like the most expensive place to live on the planet, you know. <laughs> So that's got to be an interesting thing because do you guys, uh, most of the bands I have on work jobs when you're not touring? Is that what's going on? I mean, we're, we're on the road so much. It's hard to, it's hard to grab anything when we're home, but if we're home long enough, we'll, we'll do, we'll do gigs here and there, different, different clubs and, and bars and restaurants or something just to, just to add to the fire. But no and, day uh, job. No, no real day job. Right. Right <laughs> now, I, I did notice something, and I I knew this was going to be a case with your band since you've been together around since 2011. Multiple members uh, in and out of the band, and I, me being in a band for years, I understand how fucking hard that is. And after two, three runs in a van, some people start to tap out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's a war out there, man. And it's uh you get the girlfriend that's like, Are you guys going out again? You came home <laughs> with no money. What are you doing that for? You know, so let's talk about that. Um, you lose members and then you gotta find new guys and it changes the chemistry and everything. But it seems like each time you got members, as I watched videos and live shows, the band got better. Yeah. Um I, I think the band has continued to get better through all the, all that stuff. I think it makes us, I don't, it makes us, you know, in a way push the envelope even harder than we were pushing it beforehand. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's, it's fucks with your mind, you know, when it happens at first, because you're like, this is it. Like we're moving this forward and you feel like it's almost like crashing down on the ground when it happens. And, um, but, part about being in a band is is that you have the other guys in the band that are together and that want to keep this pushing forward because plan B is, is not something that we're interested in. And, uh, and we've, we've gotten, I would say super blessed. I wouldn't even call it luck, super blessed to have some guys around us to be able to call on. And, and you know, now they're in the band for the past seven years. Uh, we just got a new keyboard player who has been in for about two years now. The other guy um, went to Toto? Yeah, yeah, our old keyboard player went to Toto, yeah. He went for that check. He's like, whoa. Pretty wild. Yeah, Toto, <laughs> man, here's a, here's, a, here's a check. <laughs> but every everyone every every move we've made in that in that realm has been only pushing the band to a different level and and pushing it higher, so but at the time, you know, at the time your mind goes into like, what are we going to do now? Uh, you know, this is, this is a key part of what we're doing. Um, so I think that what we have right now is, is, has been the most cohesive and the, the best thing moving forward that we could imagine. And, uh, you know, making another record 
with this group and and uh well i'll tell you keeping what on keeping on the guys that quit they're not making a record with dave cobb it's true fucking you know and that'll that'll fuck with you too man it's like the guy <laughs> that bought the lottery ticket and threw it away by accident and it had the winning numbers on it and then he goes <laughs> looking for that fucker for years that ticket's around here somewhere <laughs> I, uh, I, but, uh, I, yeah, Every, everyone, everyone made their choices uh, for, which I feel like for themselves, um, yeah. which is, it. which is a good place to be, you know, it's not for so. everybody, man. I've done it. I've been on yeah. the road 40 years now. Uh, it's not for everybody. And, uh, it takes a certain person and that crazy mindset of like constantly searching for that thing that's in your head. I want to get the best joke. I want to get the best song. I want to kick ass for these people that are having hard times out there and need some uh, escape. You know, it's all kinds of definitely. Things. <clears throat> now it let me. It takes a me, strange yeah. person to do what to do what we do to to be in the comedy world and the music world. Just the, being on the road constantly and city to city. It, it's not something that I think is a very normal mental space to to live in. <laughs> yeah yeah now i'm 58 i don't know how, how old are you by the way i'm 35 35 that's funny man you get a beard like that you could be 45 <laughs> you could be 28 you could be a hipster living up in uh, silver lake <laughs> you know what i mean it's, yeah. you, you don't know but um i grew up in that era of when the horde really hits the horde tour now that was a tour that was uh, kind of a, a version of Lollapalooza, but more roots rock, inter, you know, intertwined. Uh, people like, uh, you know, Rat Dog, uh, Blues Traveler, uh, Mother Hips, these type of bands. Black Crows yeah. headlined one year. So it was a, a very successful tour. But there was some bands out there, and um, one of them, nobody really knows who they are. And I listen to a lot of your music, and it really reminded me of this band called God Street Wine. They God were, Street Wine. Yeah, they were a band from the 90s. And they were fucking fantastic. Everybody's got that band that's like, you know who should have been huge? Such and such. <laughs> yeah, right. But these bands, God Street Wine and another one from Sacramento called Sweet Vine, were some of my favorite unknown bands they had record deals from columbia big deals and shit but they just never hit but um your band really reminded me of that and that era of me out touring all over which was almost kind of it wasn't college rock in the jane's addiction but it was college rock in a way of like blind melon and blues yeah, travel okay. that was a heavy college rock era too you'd play these colleges like santa barbara and thousands of people would show up uh, like a street fair and just go yeah. crazy for local music. But you can't beat that thing. No, no, but it's just wild that that was just what, what that was back then. And I kind of feel yeah. that going on now with people like Marcus King and Neil mm -hmm. Francis and uh, these groups yourselves. Uh, out there playing these cool festivals all over America in the summer, uh, you know, like Bottle Rock and Napa and this yeah. shit, where people really come out for the songs, man. You got some fucking songs. Thank you. Yeah, it's something that I think we we really tried to focus on a lot more in the past few years. I mean, I I, yeah, I would even say, um, you know, like I think the whole COVID thing kind of let us sit down and. I don't know, focus a bit more on the actual songwriting aspect than getting into the room, having a sweet jam and just kind of pushing it out. Um, but yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no. it's, it's, uh, I think, I think songs are, you know, you, you could, you can listen to a band and, and you could feel a groove. And then once you feel that groove and then you look at the songs a little bit closer and uh, you know, there's, there's bands out there that, that you're like, man, that their songs are even better than the grooves. You know, yeah. you, you know, you go for the feel, but like you're, you're immersed in like just how good the songs are I'm not saying that's us, but uh, you know, that's something that I look to in, in listening to bands and everything. Well, I think a band that uh, comes to mind when I listen to um, 
kind of uh, roots rock Americana that a, a lot of people would slag on. But now, after all these years, kind of looked back and go, holy shit, these guys got songs with Hootie and the Blowfish. Yeah. Uh, they really uh, got a beat down after they got so big. But, uh, I mean, that dude could write the shit out of a song. There was a song on the third record called Only Lonely that I thought was one of the best ballads I've heard in 20 years, you know? Um, but that was a whole fucking sound and of, of all these different groups, Spin Doctors, all this stuff. And I feel like it's coming back. And it, it's semi-jam, you know? You got the jam scene. But yeah. the difference is these bands have songs. Marcus King... He could play the shit out of a jam fest, but he's got the fucking songs. You guys got yeah. songs. Neil Francis has songs, but you also know how to jam. You know that's the key thing. Yeah, I mean it's it's part of it's part of the fun of being a musician is to be able to go up there and take songs that you that you have that can be condensed into you know a three minute thing, but being able to expand that and going out there and just kind of let's see where this one goes and. Uh, taking advantage of someone giving you a stage to do it on <laughs> and yeah. just having fun up there. Now, uh, this new record is on Joe Bonamassa's label. Um, will the Dave Cobb record be on Joe Bonamassa's record or was this record just sitting and you were waiting for somebody to put it out? No, we, uh, we didn't plan either. Like, other than the, yeah, it's kind of weird uh, talking about one record and doing another one, but, uh, yeah, they're both with Journeyman Records, which is Joe's label. Um, they were both, we, we, we kind of got in with, with them and then made the plan of doing both of them. So um, we're, we're excited to be with hanging out with them, you know, and, and uh, they've been great. And uh, it's nice to have a team behind us and, and, you know, just people working together and figuring out the best avenues and best ways to navigate the internet I, I think and, uh, it, releasing I, and everything. I think a key thing with your band and with Marcus King that I see more than any band and Rival Sons is you guys are like a 70s band where you're putting out records every year. You know, I think the big fall of uh, bands in the early 2000s was they put one record out and then five fucking years would go by. And then here comes another yeah. record. By then you're like, oh, those guys? But you guys are constantly recording and uh, putting out records. Super prolific, man. Um, was that like a plan? Like, hey, we got to keep writing records, even if we put them out ourselves? Yeah, I mean, we were doing that for years before, you know, we had any sort of label or any sort of support. We were, it kind of happened naturally for us. We were just, you know, we'd, we'd get in the room, we'd, we'd write a handful of songs and we'd go figure out how to record them. Yeah, we were we were doing kind of a, a record a year when we started. Just it just kind of felt natural, um, you know. So we we get a batch of songs and record them, and then do whatever type of independent touring that we thought we could do. Um, and then you know a, a year goes by, and then hey, let's get a new batch of songs together and record another one. So we were kind of doing that already. It was kind of our our structure and what kind of made that happen is that every time we went back to Europe, we needed something new on the merch table. Yeah. Um, you know, we go out to Europe, we tour on that record, then we come home, figure out a new record, go back out there, tour on the new record. And that's kind of what, what kept that steamroller going. Um, and, and now it's just, so it seems, it seems natural now to, to do a record a year. It just, nothing of it, you know, I mean, besides <laughs> figuring out when to write the songs when we're on the road as much as we are, but um, you know, there's, there's always learning and there's always ways around things and, and anything that keeps us pushing is always a good thing, in my opinion, instead of getting too uh, comfortable. Well, I mean, you know, there's the I think one of the big downfalls downfall, of bands these days is they're like, well, we're not going to make any money. It costs so much money to make a record, which is totally false now. Uh, why, why even do a record? <laughs> Well, I mean, you should do a record because you're constantly pushing yourself to try to write some incredible new songs and you never know when that one fucking super gold nugget's going to come out. And then next thing, I mean, look, let's let's be honest. If Stapleton or 
Marcus King or Rival Sun, any bands I'm listening to didn't put new records out, I'd be bored with that first record a long time ago, you know? So, yeah. And it drives, it drives you as an artist, like instead of going, all right, let's go out and play fucking Oh Carolina again, you know, it's like <laughs> that shit gets crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it does help. It helps a lot with, with us playing live too, because we're, we always have new songs that people want to hear. Um, so the, the, the live set never gets stale because we're always trying to keep up with it and trying to, you know, learn the new songs that are coming out and, and, and play as much as we can, you know, um, granted there's always the songs that are always in the set for the most part, because people come to a show and if we don't play them, they're sad, but, um, you know, it's, everything's kind of working in, in, in this giant cycle, you know, it's like the new record keeps, keeps us pushing and, and keeps new songs out there, but it also keeps us working as musicians on our live set so that that doesn't get stale at all. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's a giant, giant wheel that keeps on spinning. And, um, uh, yeah, but, and like you said, I mean, if, if, if we were doing this solely for the money, we, we would have quit a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> but oh, you know, there's same, something, yeah. something to, something inside of you it keeps you keeps you pushing it keeps you moving and and surrounding yourself with the people that have that same passion and that same drive are you familiar with the canadian band sheepdogs they're friends of mine yeah i know the name and i've listened to them but i i don't i don't know them personally but right but yeah it's interesting you guys are uh a very similar flavor and stuff uh it, it'd be a cool to tour to see like Marcus King, Rival Sons, you guys, and the Sheepdogs, you know, like this kind of, uh, this flavor of, uh, I, I don't even like to say Southern <laughs> Rock. I only say it, like you said, if you don't give it a label, the people won't give it a chance, you know, like, well, what's yeah. it sound like? Well, they, they've got good songs. Just go listen. Oh, uh, that's not good <laughs> enough. I need exact fucking description. Is it 73 yeah. Skinner? You know, or is <laughs> no, it it's 72? Huh? Yeah. Or is it 98 Black Crows? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, and the Europeans will tell you that too. I mean, they're, I mean, in, in the best way possible, but they'll come up and they'll be like, hey, you guys sound exactly like the Leonard Skinner in 74. And you're yeah. like, it's awesome. I'll take that all day, you know, yeah. or I, I don't know exactly how to reference that or like what that means, but. But it, it's an awesome compliment. <laughs> now your band's got a lot of uh, dual lead flavor. I just had Dwayne Betts on, who who by the way has one of the best records I've heard in a couple of years. Out, his record is insane. I don't know if you've heard it. And rest in peace, Dickie Betts. But um, the dual leads. Let's talk a little bit. You said you started on drums, and then how did you get into guitar? Uh, who was it for you? And uh, and then equipment, your your amps and guitar. I saw you play telly quite a bit on some videos. Yeah, I I go I go back and forth. Um, our guitar player Henry is really the um, the gear guy. He and he right. said to say hello. Um, right. He's a big fan. And um, yeah, so I was playing guitar. Um, my dad always playing guitar in the house. And uh, so I, I, you know, picked it up every now and then, but, but for the most part, I was a drummer. And, um, and then, I don't know, I, w I went, even went to college for drums and I was playing guitar on the side and then something clicked and I just wanted to play guitar and sing. Um, I didn't want to be a drummer. Um, I enjoy playing drums a lot, but it wasn't something that was like, you know, as much as everything else and just started writing songs and, and you know, now we're here. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I'm I'm still I'm still learning, <laughs> um, and yeah, guitars. We I, I've been using most recently. It's it's a an Eastman. They call oh, yeah. it Eastman Juliets, um, and they were gracious enough to let us kind of try out kind of like the, the 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 floor model when they were gonna release them, and uh, I fell in love with it, and um, and so did Henry, and and now that's my main guitar. I have I have two in Europe and and two here and, and that's just what I use. Um, and uh, Henry, uh, my guitar player has a signature model now, a signature Juliet that he put together with Eastman as well. Um, but Henry also, you know, plays uh, a handful of, you know, the fire Gibson Firebirds and the SGs and, 
everything. He has a lot more toys, a lot more fun. And um, yeah. And as far as amps goes, I, I usually stick with my Vox AC15. Oh, great. It's just my road dog, my road dog and, and what I use. And, uh, you know, but if ever there's another amp, um, you know, I, I use it and then Henry goes and tweaks it, make sure it sounds good. And then, and then there, there we go. <laughs> That's a great amp, the AC15, sure. man. You know, just 112, 15 watts. It's still screaming loud and it looks cool as shit up there, you know? Yeah. And I really like the yeah. tan ones, uh, the fawn. I love those. Yeah. Yeah, they made them in tan, man. I'm sure mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Dave Cobb's got a couple vintage ones around. But <laughs> Now, let's get into it a little bit about, uh, so the new record comes out, which, by the way, this is really why I wanted to interview you. Like I said, I had heard the band. I heard a song before, and I was like, oh, yeah, I, I get where they're coming from. But the new record, they <clears throat> you dropped a single called Give Love. And, you know, immediately I love this song. And this is the type of tune that I think as corny as this sounds uh, is something that we really need in this era of this insane America right now of these fucking people battling over over politics. It's just it's brutal. And people yeah. have forgotten about, hey, man. Uh, we all live in the same country. And first of all, it should be about we should love everybody. And I know that's fucking impossible in the world of racism and homophobia and insanity, but it is the goddamn truth, you know? And when I heard this Give Love, I absolutely loved it. And I was like, oh, I got to have these guys on. <laughs> so did you write that? Was it a co-written tune with somebody? Because it's just fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we had that. We had that chorus, just the the simplest, most straight to the point. We could all use a little more love in the world, and we had that that chorus and kind of how the song was going to go. And we had it years ago, um, and we just never figured out where to go from that or what else need was there. And um, we we got a, a chance to go co-write a couple songs with a guy named Tom Hambridge, who does a lot with Buddy Guy and um, Buddy Guy's drummer actually too. And um, we were in the room and we, we wrote a song with him before and he's like, what else you got? And then we, we threw out, you know, we're like, we have this chorus and this idea. And so we sat there, like the whole band's in the room and Tom and, and put together some verses and um, yeah. And it just kind of came to life and, and came to more to me and even more than that chorus does already. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, I, I think, not every song we have is, is a, is a statement for everyone to, you know, love each of other, course, but of course, um, I think we take the time in, in making sure that those certain, those, yeah, the certain songs that, that need that attention and that, that are that powerful, um, you know, give, give them the, the time and space they need. And, and, um, yeah, I, it's, it's my favorite track on the record for sure. That's an interesting writing uh, partner. Was that recommended by a, a label or something? Because Buddy Guy is not known for radio. He's a, a blues guy and stuff. And you go like, well, we want you to maybe go write some tunes with this guy that works with Buddy Guy. I'd be like, oh, well, you know, uh, we're going to write some songs with, you know, uh, radio guy, you know, <laughs> or even Dave Cobb, because Dave Cobb knows the fucking world about songwriting, you know? So what was that yeah. selection about? Uh, we were in Nashville. We were, we went to Nashville just to honestly, just to do some co-writes with people. And um, it's not really a, a huge thing that we do. We don't know a lot of people. Um, so uh, he was, he was suggested um, from our friend, Sharon. Uh, Sharon knows everybody in Nashville and, and we're like, yeah, let's do it. Um, so we just, you know, we, I, I think that, we're always open to figuring stuff out and uh, you know, we're still learning how to do those co-write things. And um, it's just, we didn't, it, we didn't even, it didn't even phase us. You know, what, what has he done? Who is he? What did everything like that? It's just, yeah, let's go there and see what happens. Um, co -writing, co -writing it, it is bizarre, out. right? It's yeah. Cause when, yeah, it's, it's a, such a Nashville machine. That's what do, people do. Oh man, I went over here and I co-writ these. You know, I mean, Marcus King did it a lot, you know. And it's um, I always tripped on it from being a songwriter and then a joke writer. Now, 
was um, I always felt that when I would go and work with some, if I was, if there was another guy in the room, I would always kind of be like, fuck, this is slowing down my weird process of when it comes, man, it comes and get the fuck out of here. I got to find this, you know? Yeah. It's definitely an art form. And it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting thing because we, we write everything with a band. So the five of us are in the room and we're all throwing stuff up and, and figuring it out as we go. And it's comfortable and we get each other. And, and uh, you know, if someone says that sounds weird, it's like there's there's the respect there where you're just trying to make the best product. And then you throw someone else in there. And, uh, you know, uh, besides like certain people, like uh, my buddy Ian Colin is, writes with us all the time and every, it's fluid and everything. But, you, you know, someone you had never met before. You know, you don't want to step on toes because you don't, you know, you're just meeting this person for the first time and, and also writing a song, which is something that sometimes can be very personal uh, to how you work and, and who you are. And um, it's definitely a strange thing. But and that's why we, we, we've been trying to do it more, because I, I think the more you do something uncomfortable, the, the better you get at it and the, the less uncomfortable it will turn into being once you do it more. Um, but yeah, you know, we're, we're always open to new things and, and trying new things out and, and finding the best songs that are out there. You just gotta put in the work and find them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now that I look at it, look back on it and I look at some of the, uh, the bands that I do listen to the Warren treaty or Marcus and, and yeah, great band. Yeah. And, and rival sons and people like that. When you think about it, you're like, well, shit, man. Um, that's almost the weirdest magic I've ever seen. You're in a room with a stranger and, you know, lightning's hard enough to strike, but then it strikes with a stranger and you. And then also sometimes people have ways. I know when I was writing on guitar, I was pretty, you know, simple. I was way into Wilco and Tom Petty. So I was always just looking for the big hook and the yeah. sim simplicity of getting there. But Sometimes when you write with people, they go, hey, try this chord that you've never played because you don't know how to fucking play it. And then you're like, oh, my God, this has way more depth. It went somewhere I would have never gone, you know? So, yeah, that is a cool thing to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's, you know, you we're already in a band. You know, there's already five ears. You know, I mean, well, ten ears, but, um, you know, five guys with ideas and everything. And and uh, it's really it's really easy to to either overdo it, you know, change something up so much that it loses that magic that you had in the very beginning. Um, and it's also, you know, really easy to do the opposite where, oh, well, this, this seems fine, but you didn't think about that one thing that could have made it a little better. It's a, uh, it's songwriting's an interesting art form um, yeah. when it comes oh, down to it. And I'm sure I, I don't know anything about joke writing. I, I feel like I have really good dad jokes, but um, I, I'm sure you know, joke writing is in the same realm where, you know, you're, you're writing something to share with someone, to let someone feel something. Um, but you almost yeah. have to feel it first yourself. Also joke writing is so hard for me because songwriting, you do it in a, in a, a rehearsal room or your bedroom or whatever with joke writing, you know, there's a few different styles. There's guys that write one liners and they just sit down at a coffee shop and they come up with these killer one liners. Then there's other people that tell long form stories and find the jokes in that. And then there's the way I write where uh, I, I'm standing somewhere and an idea comes and then I stand on stage and find it. You know, nice. I just start <clears throat> fucking talking. Yeah. And, and then when the laughs stop, then I know, okay, try it again tomorrow. Uh, this is where the laugh stopped. So try some new shit where it stopped. And you're constantly, it's like mining for gold. You know, you're panning for gold in a river and you get some shiny shit and then there it is. You know, that's how I've described joke writing or songwriting my entire life. Uh, I don't know where the fuck they come from. They come from the magic land when you're ready. And, um, even if you're not ready, you got to sit down and go, Hey, I, I, I got to finish this right here. You know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That's yeah. wild. And is there, is there co-writing when it comes to joke writing? Like do, do comedians get together and, and write jokes together and then someone gets it and someone doesn't? Well, some people hire writers because they become yeah. super famous and too busy to, uh, 
to work on bits, but uh, then other people, um, you know, they get together. When you're starting out, you're with open micers and somebody will go, hey, that fucking yeah. thing was funny. You should try this and then you'll try that. And uh, it might work. It might not work. Um, but a lot of comedians, as the years go by, they'll come up and go, hey, I kind of got a tag for that joke here. Throw this on, you know. Um, nice. But I think when you really have your your voice and your your style of writing, it's tough for people to write for you without you feeling like, ah, eh, that doesn't feel authentic to me. I think the the best part about comedy is finding it, trying to fucking find it, because once it works. It gets a little boring because, you know, not boring, but, you know, that's going to work. And uh, you put that to the side. And then when you're on the road, you do those big killer jokes, you know. But yeah. the thrill of it to me is just like, I can't fucking believe I came up with this, you know, walking down the street. And now it's starting to hit, you know. <laughs> yeah. Are you a comedy yeah. guy? Do you go see comedy at, at the Irvine Improv or? I have, I would like to do it a lot more, it, it, you know, um, and it's, uh, yeah, we, we enjoy it. And, um, it's just hard to find the time to actually, you know, when we're home for two weeks out of a time, you know, it, it's how many of those nights do you get yeah. to do something or spend it with your family? Um, uh, not, not really that you get to go out, but it, you know, like, do I want to spend this with my family or go out and do something? And usually since we're leaving in two weeks, it's like, family first for the whole time we're home and then we go back out and um yeah there's on when we're on the road we always have mondays off usually and mondays are not the best night to go see comedy i, I found out yeah um yeah yeah but yeah we were right. we, but we were we were where were we we were up in uh, it's like snowmass village um up in colorado and uh you know there was there was a comedy night so like we had the night off so we went down there and it was just like a locals comedy night is a blast love yeah. it do you watch yeah. uh netflix uh, uh you guys you don't have a tour bus yet right you're in vans no we're in the van baby right yep um do you watch comedy on netflix and stuff like that yeah yeah i try to try to be somewhat relevant in the world and and see the new specials here and there yeah um our bass player warren's really on top of it uh, I mean, he sees every special that comes out, every podcast that's out there he listens to and, and is really uh, up to date on 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 shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's like Dave from the Rival Sensor bass player. He loves comedy, you know, and uh, he's all over it. He goes to see it when he's home at Zany's in Nashville. Uh, let me ask you something. You recorded nice. at Sunset Sound, uh, one of your records, I believe. Fantastic fucking studio. Uh, the infamous Van Halen and all of that done. In sure. There. Um, how was your experience in there? You know, uh, what was that in 2020 or something? Oh man. Um, I can't even tell you what date it was. I mean, yeah. we, we've done stuff. We, we did, we, I think we did two tracks in there with Joe Bonamassa and Josh Smith and two tracks in there with Kevin Shirley. Um, and then we recorded a full record there a long time ago before 2020. Um, but I, yeah, but, but as, as far as sunset sound goes, it's just, it's in a really kind of a weird spot in LA. Brutal homeless area. And, uh, now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just funky. And, uh, but once you go through like this gate, you know, to actually get in there, a little corridor, then you're like, you're trapped in this, uh, I don't know, like a weird little vortex of like thinking about everything that's been done there and, and everyone that, I mean, Van Halen and, and Prince and everything. And you're just kind of enraptured in, in this vibe. And at least that's how I try to kind of get it. And I kind of go, cool. We're not in the middle of homeless LA right now. Like we're, we're at this studio and that's all we need to worry about. Um, but yeah, the rooms are great. I mean, they sound killer. The, uh, the people that work there are phenomenal and uh, it is really comfortable for us. I mean, we've done plenty of different sessions there and, and it's feels like it doesn't feel like you're walking into a, some sterile, you know, 
uncomfortable studio. It, it feels great. Oh, well, I always say any studio that used to have a lot of cigarette smoking in it, it it's got something good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Oh, can I, hear you some, hear? I hear some rock. Can you hear that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. all good. Um, or if, if it's fine with you, I'll let it, I'll yeah, let it, yeah. I'll let it go. Or I can well, move. <laughs> well, we'll wrap it up anyway because uh, I don't, I don't want to keep it too long, but um, I want to talk about the new record. Okay, so it's coming out, uh, what, June 24th? I think it's June. I think it's June 28th. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I'm right. Uh, yeah. I think uh, it's June 28th. Some yeah. great songs on there. Uh, Rager, <laughs> Worried Mind, I Love. Like I said, Give Love. One song on here that really hit me and the Bon Jovi documentary being out right now, which also Bon Jovi, I think, wrote one of the greatest ballads ever, I'll Be There For You. Uh, this song, Ballad of a Broken Hearted Man, uh, it's got a Jovi kind of vibe from the New Jersey era. And I'm not talking hair metal. Hey, guys. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah. You know, Jovi, uh, if he wasn't in that hair metal era, um, I think that he would almost be, you know, respected way more as a songwriter, you know, because holy shit, could that guy write a fucking song? Um, yeah. But, but that song, uh, Ballad of a Broken Hard Man, really kind of has a, a a Jovi vibe to me at the front, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That yeah, the and, and that was that was just, you know, kind of how we put it together in the in the in the studio with Kevin Shirley. I mean, just kind of creating that uh that intro, you know, that like West like you can just kind of see, like visualize kind of like a Western or something and, and just kind of bringing it in. Um, but yeah, that was, that was such a fun track to put together. And, um, you know, it's one of those, one of those songs too, that you did, you know, just lightning strikes and you're in the room and, and it, it works and you, you kind of know it at the time. And then once you, you know, once you actually record it, it takes all of new life. Now, did Kevin Shirley, uh, produce the entire record? Yeah. Red wow. Moon Rising. Yep. Wow. Wow, man. That's yeah. an interesting, uh, He's done a lot of records, you know, and uh, Aerosmith and and stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, How did Black that Crows. come? Black Crows. Black Crows. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Uh, he did that by your side record. You know. Yeah, I mean it's it. It was. I mean, he's done Iron Maiden. I mean, he's it's he's done tons of stuff, and uh, he's he's really close with the Journeyman record team. You know, and it was just kind of, and we, we met him beforehand. We've done these cruises, the Joe Bonamassa, keeping the blues alive at sea cruise. And that's where we met everybody. Before I knew who Kevin was. Um, and so being in the studio with Kevin was just super comfortable. It was, you know, we knew each other. We, you know, it was just, uh, it felt natural in a way. It wasn't us meeting him and being like, oh, you know, we're going to record music. It was, uh, it felt really good. It felt really, you know, just we were just buddies hanging out. And we just happened to be recording music at the same time. Did you record this uh, record to tape, or is it Pro Tools, or how how do you guys record? It's Pro Tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. what studio? Uh, Village Village Studios in LA. Oh, what a great yeah. studio! Oh my god. Yeah, killer. Was, oh, another was, was another fucking iconic <laughs> studio, man. That owner. Yeah. That owner is amazing. That owns the place. He put on those uh, those giant uh, festivals in L.A. in the seventies. Man, uh, what was it? Cal, Cal California Rock or whatever. Cal, I forget what. Yeah, California Rock, Cal Rock Festival or whatever. Yeah. Oh man, the guy. The guy is rock. That owns that place, man. Unbelievable and great studio. Yeah, killer, killer room. It's super, it was rad. Just yeah. a great time. I mean, I, nothing beats Savannah, but, uh, you know. Cal Jam. So that's that's what it was called. Cal, Cal Jam. Jam. Yeah, yeah, okay. This fucking guy put on Cal Jam. And so when I was nice. there, I said, oh, look at that Cal Jam photo. He goes, oh, yeah, I put it on. Here, you want to see some Cal <laughs> Jam merch? And he had fucking jackets and shirts and, and buttons. and Oh, my Sick. God. The, the guy is, I mean, that's a fucking tough, tough business these days these iconic la studios uh you know uh sunset sound 
the village. Yeah. Uh, 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 what you call it? The uh, the one where um, a girl got the soundboard from. Um, oh, Sound City. Sound City, man. You know, yeah, all these Henson, Henson Studios. East Henson. West. And then there was one in Malibu in the hills where Kravitz did. Uh, he did um, the second record, I believe. I forget, and Corn did their records up there. I forget what it was called. Yeah, yeah, the name escapes me too. Yeah, but man, they, there was just there was just these famous studios in town. Oh, you actually did yeah. one at the Swing House, also. Yeah, we our very first, you know, kind of going into a studio with a producer and and kind of doing it like that we went into swing house yeah man i forgot about that it was a long time ago <laughs> well, you, you've, you've worked in some fucking fantastic studios now where you're at is that actually a recording studio or like a house or something yeah i mean it's a little bit of both yeah it's, yeah. Uh, yeah it's it's i mean I'm, I'm in this little little room upstairs right now but uh yeah it's it's pretty awesome we're super happy to be here and uh yeah uh congrats on the new record and congrats on the dave cobb record that's going to be fucking thank you so much and this new record man it sounds really fucking good got some good songs i can't wait to see what dave cobb does with you guys he is uh seems to be a fucking a master and um uh look forward to seeing you live somewhere out there on the road one day i'm sure i'll i'll get to see yeah we're there yeah yeah that'd be great are you you got a tour, uh, U.S. tour or anything coming up? Uh, we'll be heading out to Europe at the end of June, and then we're back, and then we do a stateside run, uh, kind of East Coast um, into the East Coast into the Midwest. I would say uh, late July, early August, and then uh, we do another run from L.A. basically out to out to Nashville in September, and then we're home for a little bit, and then we go back out to Europe in November. Damn! All right, man. Well, good yeah. meeting you, brother. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Thank oh, you. Oh, 100%, man. And uh, everybody get this new record. Comes out on June 28th. And go see him live out there. And uh, tell a friend, man. Support the new music out there, even though they've been around since 2011. Uh, one day <laughs> they're going to be the uh, overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think once Dave Cobb does your record, people are like, what? Who's this band? You know, he is that kind of Rick Rubin flavor now when Rick would just do a record. Anything Rick did, people were like, Dixie Chicks? All right. I didn't like them before, (laughs) but Rick says it's cool. (laughs) We got to get the fuck out of here. I don't know why he's freezing on us. You got that Savannah (laughs) internet, man, that fucking turtle net. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Sorry. (laughs) All right, brother. I love you, man. Thanks for uh, doing the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. I'll see you, bud. All right. See you later.